Hello and welcome to Prostate Cancer Uncensored, a podcast produced by Zero, the end of prostate cancer. This episode is brought to you in partnership with Bayer. Today, we continue our conversation with Twisted Sisters J.J. French. French is a rocker, an author, and a prostate cancer survivor. In part two of our conversation, J.J. talks candidly about sex before and after prostate cancer. Plus, we'll talk to Dr. Neely Gandhi. Dr. Gandhi breaks down two options, operation versus radiation. And now, Zero's CEO and president, Jamie Burse, talks with J.J. French from J.J.'s home in Manhattan. This podcast is called Prostate Cancer Uncensored because we want to have real talk. And you've been open um, to talking about uh, your side effects of prostate cancer um, and the treatment uh, that come along with the disease. Um, now tell us, what was life like um, after the diagnosis and, um, and, I, and I guess treatment? Well, okay. so in terms of the radical prostatectomy and getting over the operation itself, I got over it pretty quickly. You know, I mean, the first week was tough and wearing a, wearing a catheter in your penis for a week is probably the worst week of your life. You know, it's just horrible. When they removed that catheter, I kissed that the nurse or whatever, the practitioner. I said, I love you. I said, do you hear that often? And she goes, every day. It's awful. It's just, you know, it's just not, it's not, you know, look, here's the deal, guys. The first question you have to ask yourself is, do I want to live? That's the first question. If the answer is, I want to live, then everything else becomes a matter of, decisions that you have to make and how well you can adjust and adapt. But you have to say to yourself, I'd rather live than die. And that really was the issue. I said, I said, uh, I had a very, very healthy sex life. I'm one of these people that had no issues. I didn't need any pills, nothing. My hormone levels are normal. Um, my brother took seeds and radiation. And when you go that route, they give you Luprin, I think, it's it, if I'm not mistaken, and that destroys your testosterone levels. And you have to hope your testosterone levels return. And in many cases, it doesn't return. So your sex drive is shot. That's something to keep in mind. Not all people, but a lot. Um, my testosterone levels never changed. They're the same today as they were prior. However, um, uh, depending on how old you are, depends on how on how much the nerves come back and how much sex can become normal. So I've had friends who had prostate cancer who are in their early 50s who post prostatectomy after like 6 months came back 100% erectile wise. And that's great for them. I was, you know, um, I was 60 66 and it didn't. So there's a lot of work that has to go into sex a lot and you have to be prepared to deal with things you never thought you'd have to deal with so uh after three years of thinking the nerves will come back they came back to a degree but not enough so you need things and there's a lot of things out there there's shots which are not uh the most comfortable thing to deal with but they're injections you make into your penis there's pills you take along with the shots. There's vacuum pumps you can use. I mean, you have to make an appointment for sex. That's the truth. Sex can no longer be spontaneous. That whole idea of spontaneous sex is over. I mean, I am not saying that it's over for everybody, but it was over for me. Yeah. So uh, now it's sex by appointment and you have to set aside time and you have to prepare. Now, what does that say about your spouse? You have to have a spouse. You have to. Um, you have to have a, a calendar. You have to have a spouse that that is happy that you're alive, and would rather have you here than not here. And that way, you can work it out. And you figure out the ways to work it out. But if you don't have a spouse that can deal with it, that's an issue. That is unavoidable. When you have a radical prostatectomy the process of connecting your penis to your urethra causes shortening lengthwise 
because they have to connect parts that were not there. They're removing a prostate gland. Your prostate gland, you know, here's the things that then I'll talk about. Um, women have um, one sphincter muscle. Men have two sphincter muscles. Men have, have a sphincter muscle in their penis and a sphincter muscle in their anus. And both of them are used to prevent peeing, you know, unless you need to pee. You can hold them both. Women have one, which is why women can wear undergarments if necessary. When they cough, sneeze, getting over pregnancy because everything is open more. They have a single sphincter. Men have two. Prostate cancer removes one. So with one sphincter muscle, you have a lot more control problems. So forgetting sex for a while, you have to talk about premature urination. That becomes an issue. You have to train yourself how not to. You know, none of this, I don't mind talking about any of it, and, but none of it is easy for people to process when they've told they have prostate cancer. I had it, I, the idea of prostate cancer lasted, it allowed me to process all of this for years. So this wasn't like something dropped in my lap on a Saturday, on a, on a, on a Monday afternoon with a test result and told, you got to do this, 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 and this is what's going to happen to you. I already knew all of these things. And, uh, you know, so you have to deal with all these things. And these are difficult things to deal with. So I have a wife who is extremely supportive no pressure. Uh, to begin with, you can't have sex for six months after the operation anyway, just for starters. You can't. So that's issue one. Okay. Then as far as your ability to return through the nerve connections, that's individual. Everybody has different. Um... Now, from what I understand, because I react well to shots and to vacuum pumps, that's good. There are people who don't even do that, which I guess there's all different levels of of coming back from this. And so, you know, given no problems at all or absolutely complete inability to ever have sex again, you know, if, if no problems is a one and incredibly difficult is a 10, I'm a five. Okay. So I can do it. It just takes time and work and effort, uh, but it takes time, work, and effort. That is for sure. So you have to be prepared for, um, for that. Do you talk to um, your friends or others who have been impacted by prostate cancer um, about their, their sex life? You know, obviously, you know, this guy's, you know, we talk about sex with, with other men. Um, we talk, we talk about sex with other men. Um, we know those conversations can shift, um, you know, with, with age, with your diagnosis of prostate cancer. But uh, do you have conversations with um, your friends in this area of your life? A couple of them have been extremely open, extremely helpful. And one of them just didn't want to talk about it at all. But two of them who, who use shots were very open with me, you know, and, and helped me through it for sure. You know, plus the hospital itself, um, NYU has a, erectile dysfunction department, which is helpful because, you know, they deal with erectile dysfunction from a variety of different places, not just prostate cancer. So, uh, but they handle people with, with getting over prostate cancer. And so meeting with them and talking to them about their issues becomes important too. So if your hospital provides that kind of um, reinforcement, that you know use it of course you know don't don't be shy about it you know you're talking to doctors you know wh wh what are you doing you know you need information and they'll help you through it so i've spoken to friends of mine about nyu's erectile dysfunction department and they said wow you have an erectile dysfunction department that's amazing you know so they did and i've used it and I, I mean, I've had a lot of consultation with them. And it's helped. Hearing about uh, experiences from a couple of uh, friends that you've had has helped um, helped you in your your journey, your path. Yeah, I think everybody wants to know where they stand vis-a-vis -vis everybody else. Am mm -hmm. I better or worse? Is this normal? Is this not normal? You know that kind of thing you ask yourself all the time. You know, am I going through? Am I going through? 
what's someone else going through? Am I going through similar things? Is this just me? A lot of times we internalize this stuff. Oh, my God. Oh, woe is me. It all happened to me. Woe is me. Um, you know, I'm, I, I was in a famous rock band, so I still am, but, you know, for years and years and years. So my, my, um, my ability to rationalize this thing and going, well, you know, I had a lot of fun for many, many years and it's not really, uh, it's not like I didn't fulfill whatever kind of fantasies I wanted to without getting too specific about it because I don't talk about it. But let's just say that um, it's easier to deal with, I think, if you're not having fantasies about what you never did and now you can't do it. But that's a completely separate, I mean, that's a, personal statement for me. I have no idea how people process it. All I know is, is that I used to make a joke that when I'm 90, I'm going to be sitting on a park bench and a guy's going to talk about what, you know, they did in their youth. And I'll just sit there like a Cheshire cat, like not having to say anything because I did everything they could have ever fantasized about. So with that as a, you know, I guess, uh, look, Will Chamberlain slept with 20,000 women in and uh, Gene Simmons claims to have slept with 10,000. Of course, I don't know how you have time to do anything if that's what you've done, if you think about how long it takes, unless you're the 62nd guy, you know. But um, let's just say that it was a bit easier to deal with it in that sense. And that sounds so, I know that's, you know, I don't want that to sound as um, self-serving as it sounds. But here's the point, regardless of what that is, everyone's satisfaction or lack thereof is unique to that person. And how you process that ongoing is unique to you. So regardless of what you've done, what your history could be, once you can't do it, it becomes an issue, right? So I look at the world and go, well, you know, um, I didn't have a stroke. I can use my legs. I can walk. I mean, there's many things I can do and don't take that for granted. Um, and, uh, and, and everything will work itself out. And again, a supportive spouse is extremely important or a supportive girlfriend is extremely important during this time. Yeah. Put it all in, uh, in perspective of, um, you know, what, what, um, what can you do and versus what, um, can't you do or what, uh, yeah. you're having difficulty with. Yeah. I was going to say that, um, you know, rock stars have certain, you know, image to uphold in terms of sexuality, but it sounds like maybe, you know, it didn't uh, come to bear around your prostate cancer diagnosis. Cause I think I hear you saying that like, well, a bunch of my uh, rock star friends died of prostate cancer too. I mean, they're dead. So it's not like it helped them <laughs> at all. You right. know, I mean, you know, look at the end of the day, you go home alone, you go home with your, with your spouse, boyfriend, girlfriend, whatever. Yeah. You know, um, your partner, and it's the two of you. And it's how the two of you, for the most part, um, handle life situations, whether it's health, finances, it's all the same. It's all, it's all similar, how you, how you face challenges. It's a challenge, you know? So again, I didn't want to die. So I was prepared to accept whatever, whatever hit me. But I, also was a, I was also saying, I'll do whatever I can do to lessen the severity of the side effects of all of it. So luckily, I, there are pathways in which I can do that. Some people can't. It's a tough choice. But what are you going to do? I mean, are you really going to just die? Is that what you're going to do? Like, just say, hey, screw it. I'll just, you know, enjoy myself to the end. I don't know anyone who's made that decision yet. But uh, there are plenty of guys who've died. Look, I, I had a friend who died of prostate cancer who didn't know he had. He was 40 years old. He had severe back pain. And he went to the doctor and he was stage four. And it was done. He was gone in two months. Okay? He was gone in two months. So would he have gladly traded places had he known two years earlier, three years earlier? I'm sure he would have. So, you know. Uh, but, you know, it, it, every day you read a story about a rock star or a, you read a story about some famous person that has some sort of illness. It seems that people are being more honest about their physical issues now and they're talking about it. I mean, Ronnie Wood from the Rolling Stones just had a second bout of, of cancer. Um, 
Pete Way from UFO died of prostate cancer. I think Johnny Ramone or Joey Ramone died of it as well. I mean, there's, there's, it's a lot. And then what about all the people that died that didn't want to talk about it? Right. Plenty of them. And how many of them died of AIDS that didn't want to talk about it? Or, uh, you know, I just had a friend of mine die of ALS last week. 56-year-old brain surgeon. Okay, 56-year-old brain surgeon diagnosed with ALS a year ago and died last week. And you realize how fleeting life is. And as you get older, you become more philosophical about what life means to you. Um, if religion is your thing, then you put your faith in whomever. But I always tell people, you can put your faith in a higher power, but you need a good surgeon. <laughs> you know, I mean, if your higher power leads you to a good surgeon, then your higher power did the job. But who's saving you is not the higher power. A good surgeon is saving you. So find a good surgeon. And, uh, and, and, and hopefully that choice you make with that with that surgeon will help you. And, and by the way, finding a good surgeon is the key in all this. Finding a good hospital and a good surgeon and, and studying it is really important. And I, uh, you know, I, I was on the prostate cancer. There's a Facebook page. Sometimes it's disheartening to read it because there are people who's, who are near the end of their life because for whatever reason, the treatments didn't work or they got the treatments too late or whatever. And those are sad stories. And then you hear other stories that are, are good. I try not to allow myself too much negativity um, because I don't think it's good for you psychologically to allow that much negativity. So the people that run to the Facebook pages and to the, um, uh, to the resources that hearing other people's advice, it can be a double-edged sword. You can read stuff and get really depressed. Um, uh, in fact, you'll probably be more affected by the bad stories than you will about the good stories. So I just choose to kind of focus in on my own situation, my own doctor's information and deal with my own because it's unique and everyone's disease is like a snowflake, which is unique to them. We have a Facebook page uh, for patient survivors and caregivers called Zero Connect. And uh, I was going to echo what you were saying is that uh, it really has to be a buffet of, you know, take Take what's you know, of meaning uh, for you on uh, what can what can you take out of it uh, for advice or positivity uh, to keep going with, with your journey and the, the best life possible. Yeah, I think what happens is everyone looks at statistics because that's all we have, really. You know, how 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 long ago, how long have I had it? How old am I? What stage is it in? What are the general um, conditions by which people continue on with their lives, given it. So I was at this cuspy age, you know, 66. They said, well, you can have an operation, you could have radiation. Like they seem to say that we, they'd like to have an operation at a younger age and radiation and at an older age in general. That's what they say. And I said, why is that? And they said, because at a younger age, your body's more apt to uh, come back from an operation. More, you know, it takes a lot out of you as an older age. And I said, well, what should I do? And they said, you're on the cusp of your choice. So you can make both choices. Whereas if you were 70, we would tell you have radiation in seeds. Okay. So I toughed it out and had the operation. So that was that. It's another issue too. You know, it's how much research have you done? How much have you read? How many conversations with doctors have you had? And have you spoken to your friends and have they been supportive? Um, knowledge is power when it comes to this. So I didn't equivocate. You know, this has just been sitting there for years. And so I knew that when it happened, I was going to waste You know, like I said to my doctor, how much time do I have to make this decision? So I said to him, and he said, from what we see, not much. Like you got like two months to figure this out. You know, you don't have a year or two years. This isn't watchful waiting, bro. This is Gleason 9, you know, liar, liar, pants on fire. <laughs> you know, you got to come to terms with this now. You know, so, okay, so I did. You're listening to Prostate Cancer Uncensored, and our guest is Twisted Sisters J.J. French, a rocker, author, and prostate cancer survivor. This episode is part of a three-part series with J.J. French, brought to you in partnership with Bayer. Head over to zerocancer.org slash podcast to download and listen to all three episodes. And now, it's time for Zero's Ask the Doctor segment. Hello, I'm Greg Broy, Manager of Donor and Fundraising Communications here at Zero. I'm also a prostate cancer survivor, and I want to expand on our conversations with J.J. French by talking with Dr. Neelay Gandhi. 
Dr. Gandhi is a surgeon and urologist for Potomac Urology in the Washington, D.C. area. He's also a member of Zero's Medical Advisory Board. Earlier in the podcast, JJ mentioned that his brother chose seeds and radiation to treat his prostate cancer. So my first question for Dr. Gandhi is, tell us more about those options. Yeah, seeds is a very common prostate cancer treatment, and and it's very easy for patients to remember as well. Um, We call it brachytherapy, and that's the same as seeds. And there's actually two different versions of doing this where um, it is done in an operating room. um, And the traditional form of seeds involves um, implanting radiation beads into the prostate. And these radiation beads will typically um, radiate from the inside out. So these are beads that do remain in the prostate. So we place them in the operating room and then you go home and they are emitting radiation from within you. And so that has been the traditional method. um, And that's still somewhat the standard when people describe seeds. Um, For that short time period, you are slightly considered radioactive. Um, And so because you are emitting radiation, typically it's recommended that you um, kind of limit certain activities or limit interactions with people, especially not having, you know, if you have grandchildren or anyone um, sitting on your lap, because again, there is a mild degree of radiation exposure. So there has been a newer form now as well called HDR, high dose rate brachytherapy. And that involves something uh, like a similar procedure in the operating room but this time we're inserting needles into the prostate and radiating the prostate at that time. So that once everything is removed, there are no seeds, there are no um, radiation devices or implants left in you and you are not then considered radioactive. And so there there is a big shift in terms of um, transitioning towards high dose rate brachytherapy. But again, the traditional method of seeds is described as the implantation of those radioactive devices um, into the prostate. JJ also mentioned that his brother's treatment was followed up with Lupron. Lupron is a form of hormone therapy, but what exactly does this mean for testosterone levels? Lupron acts to um, somewhat lower your testosterone levels. And, And the way I describe that to men is it's similar to male menopause. So we, we understand that menopause in women due to dropping estrogen levels, and they can have various side effects related to that. Well, this is very similar in terms of dropping your testosterone levels, then you may experience weight gain, hot flashes, decreased sexual desire and libido. Um, these are all common things that can be attributed to these hormone changes. Now, the benefit of it is when we drop your testosterone levels, um, an easy way to think about it is that testosterone can act as a food supply to the prostate, but it also can act as a food supply to the cancer. And so by dropping those levels, we're trying to somewhat starve the prostate and starve the cancer prior to starting radiation therapy so that you now have a weaker cancer that is more susceptible to the radiation therapy, making that treatment more effective. A radical prostatectomy is an operation to remove the prostate and tissues surrounding it. Can you tell us what else this involves physically and why this operation can lead to incontinence and sexual side effects? Yeah, so radical prostatectomy is is the surgical procedure to remove the entire prostate gland and remove the prostate from the body. And um, that can be done mainly with either an open approach, which involves an ins- a larger incision um, and in our hands inside to remove the prostate, or more commonly now it's performed robotically. And those are with small incisions on the belly for us to do this in a minimally invasive fashion. And what it ultimately entails is removal of the prostate. Now the prostate sits below the bladder And there's also the urethra, that's the tube that you urinate through. And so by removing the prostate, you have a gap between your bladder and your urethra in terms of for urination. And so because of that, we do have to connect those two together, which is why people require a catheter temporarily 
to allow that area to heal. So once the catheter is removed, you're able to urinate the normal way. Well, there are pelvic floor muscles involved in that region that may become a little weaker. And that's where when um, you think of the external sphincter, when you think of trying to control, if someone says you need to go urinate now and you squeeze those muscles to prevent urination, those muscles can become weak um, after this surgery. And that's why we have patients practice Kegel exercises to try and strengthen the pelvic floor. But because of that, you could have some, what we call stress incontinence. When you cough, sneeze, stand up, you may have leakage of urine. And so that's where the incontinence aspect can come from. There are nerves that run alongside the prostate and those nerves typically are dissected off of the prostate. We call that a nerve sparing prostatectomy. If in the appropriate patient, we can do that, then that can help to preserve or improve erectile function after surgery. However, there are times that we do have to remove those nerves if there's concern of involvement with cancer. And again, that can impact a patient's erection function. When a man is diagnosed and it comes down to an operation versus radiation, is a man's age a factor in which treatment he should get? Yeah, there's, there's many factors that come into play in terms of if someone should choose either active surveillance, watching the cancer, surgery to remove the prostate, or radiation therapy. And age does play a role in that. Um, I think historically, we used to look at it as 70 being a cutoff, that if you were below the age of 70, you should have surgery. If you were above the age of 70, you should have radiation. I think as studies have come out showing that you know, the, the effectiveness of both surgery and radiation um, for different risk groups for prostate cancer um, may still be beneficial. I think that age barrier has somewhat decreased and it's really a conversation with patients um, to assess their risk factors. Mainly, if you have someone who is a high surgical um, risk candidate, so someone who may have had multiple heart attacks, has already had multiple surgeries in the past, um, may not be the, the picture of health, that they may not do well with a surgical procedure and may be better served by doing radiation. Um, you can have the opposite though. We've seen, I've seen many patients who are you know, in their seventies and they are extremely fit in shape. They look like they're in their fifties um, and they may still be a great surgical candidate. So I think, again, it's really individualizing that risk in terms of what treatment affords them the best opportunity at a cure, whether it's surgery or radiation, as well as the patient preference that we do have a lot of patients who come and say, I, I've had bad experiences with um, surgery or radiation in, talk, in terms of talking to friends and family, um, and I would like to do this instead. And having these informed conversations with the patients, I think are always helpful as well. Thank you, Dr. Gandhi, for your time and insight. Again, Dr. Gandhi is a surgeon and urologist with Atomic Urology in the Washington, D.C. area. You've been listening to Prostate Cancer Uncensored, a podcast produced by Zero: The End of Prostate Cancer. This episode is brought to you in partnership with Bayer. Head over to zerocancer.org to learn more about prostate cancer, Zero's programs, and to download more podcasts.